Volume. You can just hoot. Are uh, you at the second gate? I've arrived at a compound northeast of Pretoria in South Africa to visit private investigator Mike Bolhays. As I sit outside the giant gate by the intercom, Mike sends me a voice note via WhatsApp. It's how he likes to communicate. Just come into the premises, to the middle of the premises. You'll see a garage in the middle of the premises, but you must hoot at the second gate. They'll open for you. I hoot and the gate opens. I drive in. This is Mike's home and the office for his company, Specialized Security Services. They investigate violent and economic crimes. And I'm here to talk to him about a case that he has worked on. In fact, he's been helping the police on extensively over the last five years. This compound is also home to dozens of flamingos. I'm very conscious not to graze one with my car as I drive in. Mike is passionate about animals, and there is a whole section on his website dedicated to flamingo chicks and how to introduce them to new habitats. This info is just one click away from the list of violent crimes his company has worked on. Hello. Mike, I can see you. Good. Go in. Oh, sure. the motor. <laughs> I've been wearing a mask, even while alone in my car. Embarrassed, I take it off. We don't shake hands, of course, but instead I immediately sit down. There are huge koi swimming around in a floor-to-ceiling tank in the corner of his office. Mike has an angular face and spiked-up blonde hair that is subtly going white. <coughs> <coughs> Don't worry, I don't have anything. That's okay. It's because of exercises. I exercise immensely. I do CrossFit and stuff, and it works a bit on my chest every now and then. No, I can imagine. I'm here to talk to Mike about an assassination. Wandile Boswana was killed in October 2015 while stopped at a red traffic light on the N1 Grasfontein off-ramp here in Pretoria. Boswana was being driven around by his business partner, a young, beautiful woman called Mpu Beloy. They were in a yellow Renault Clio that was branded with Boswana's recently launched energy drink, the unfortunately named Orgasma. He was shot nine times, and a detail that sticks out for me that Mpu relayed in court was that during the shooting, Boswana rolled over her to try and shield her from the fire. He tried to catch as many of the bullets with his own body as possible so she wouldn't be hurt. I mean, it's amazing. Despite this, Mpu was shot twice, but was able to drive them both to Unitas Hospital in Pretoria, where she received help, and Boswana promptly died at the age of 43. If it wasn't for Boswana's actions, they probably both would have been killed. I'm specifically going to speak today on hits, hits in South Africa and the Boswana hit, many guys came out and many guys shot many bullets. But just randomly shooting, shooting the car up, shooting it full of holes. When I first heard these details around Boswana's death, I felt a huge amount of empathy for him. But when I contacted Mike, who was employed by Boswana's family to investigate the case, I realized that this murder represents so much of how South Africa functions. It is one of the most known hits and it has been done by one of the most notorious groups in South Africa uh, under the head of Vusi Keke Matibela. This is allegedly Boswana's assassin, known colloquially as KK, a man who has been openly referred to in the media as South Africa's Al Capone. The criminal side that Mike is talking about is alleged. 
in terms of being involved in the Boswana murder, KK has been arrested but not convicted. But what is true is KK is very involved with the taxi industry. They are also involved with authorities. No crime in South Africa can actually, in this level, be committed without police involvement. What is true is that syndicates responsible for assassinations in South Africa are generally suspected of working together with the authorities. Whether that's in government or with uh, the local police station or special forces. Boswana, his alleged assassin, and those who allegedly ordered the hit tell a perfect story of what it means to be in South Africa today. And that's why I'm here. That's why I'm looking at this case. Welcome to Too Many Enemies. I'm Paul McNally. In these six episodes, we will be looking at the assassination of billionaire Wandile Boswana and what his murder means for the state of politics, crime and justice in South Africa. We pick up the story while sitting across from private investigator Mike Bolhays. I can still hear the flamingos in the background. I actually have the idea, I cannot prove it, that he was meant to suffer. So sometimes you do get hits that is done, like the Boswana hit, where they, in my opinion, mm. a message was sent, where the wounds, they knew that he would die, mm. but it would take time for him to die. Others would say that the hitmen that were used were simply cheap and inexperienced. As Balhase explains, there is a range in terms of cost. There's a lot of eager, willing and able hitmen available that will do hits from anything from 5,000 rand to maybe 20. Your professional hitman can do anything from 500,000 up. Later on, in this very episode, we will hear claims from some of Vusi's friends that the Boswana hit was ordered by rich, influential individuals with no expense spared. So the Boswana case is a case which hit the headlines because he was a very controversial character and he was swimming upstream and he was going against the flow. The way Mike sees it is Boswana created a life where he was constantly competing for government tenders. And this meant that he was always making enemies. If there's competition, they will try and oust each other or do each other in or Mm. go against each other. Or if if, uh, it is possible, they will actually tie up together and work together in order to make money. Exactly what Boswana did to upset certain players, we will get into in a later episode. Wandile was definitely not squeaky clean. He was not clean at all. He he had a a wife, um, but he also had many girlfriends. He lived a devious and a a robust life. He he was a joller, what we would call a joller. He would go out. Being a joller in South African slang means someone who parties. And in Boswana's context, this would mean fancy clubs, VIP access, buying bottles of the most expensive spirits instead of just shots, fancy cars to get to the parties, and all the rest. He was very flamboyant. He was spending a lot of money, had a lot of friends. As a matter of fact, he was very close, closely linked with the very guys that I've mentioned here that took him out. Right. He was very, very close with uh, the whole Vusi KK group and all his henchmen which had been coming for years. He was very close with the taxi association. He was very close with uh, government officials, with senior policemen. Mm. But he had an arrogance towards him, and he had a short temper, and he had a, a threatening manner in himself of exposure and going against. And he was strong-headed. So he was not a player. According to Mike, Boswana always hung this threat over his associates that he would expose them. And he knew enough about them 
that this would be devastating. And it was shocking for me to see that one dealer had everything, but he wanted more. And he had a wife, beautiful wife, but he, he had to have the gangster wives. He had to be involved with the gangsters. He had to do things corruptly and be involved in corruption and then wanted to run the corruption in his way. He was corrupt. And these criminals all turned against each other and they took him out. And usually and mostly in cases like these, it's the innocent people amongst, the wives, the children, the innocent bystanders, those that work for them, that gets hurt the most. You must understand when a hit goes down on that level, it is not just one guy that says, you know, I can't take this guy here, he goes out. They actually do it like we know in the old mafia movies. They have a get-togethers and they have discussions and discussions about it. Then somebody gives the order, which is high up, which will make sure that there's a couple of middlemen in between so it doesn't hit back on him. Boswana was originally a police officer and only quit the service in the mid-90s. He died a billionaire. So whatever he did, he got rich incredibly fast. What was heartbreaking to me is to see what happens to people that is not used to fame and fortune. Fame and fortune can corrupt people. I've seen that with Fusi as well. But if you get rich quickly and you get the fame quickly, it can go to your head. We always say it. We always warn our kids and everybody. Mike was brought onto the case because he was paid by the family to investigate. But he also enjoys the publicity. It's good for business to show involvement in solving high-profile hits. So clients would hire us because the police can't do the work and because we are we are extremely well-known in this country, extremely feared. We are the most well-known and the most feared in this country because of our expertise. Mike and his team have an attack squad of their own. We can also violently act. In other words, if we get a call that a person is kidnapped and we have to move in with our task team and remove, we can do that and we can do it violently. In other words, we can fuck them up properly. Mm. The police can't do that. Right. But anyway... Um, that's the advantage of being a private organization. Yeah. We, there's many more things we can do and enter and assist with in order to, to, to deal with the crime but also prevent crime. And in turn, he helps the police with their investigations. We can give a complete investigation to the specialized unit in the police that mm -hmm. is appointed to do this investigation. But unless they use that information properly, and do the prosecution on that information and further the investigation and push it through the courts and through what is required in any police case in South Africa presented in such a way, it means nothing. Do you find it's, it can be quite frustrating in that you can put all this work in, you can get everything to a certain point and you have to hand it over to the police and then they can still not kind of um, do it properly? It is extremely frustrating. I have driven huge distances all across the country to try and get a sit down with the family on numerous occasions and ultimately they have refused, partly because they think that it will endanger their own lives to speak. So they won't be commenting on this story or any part of this series. When Boswana was first killed, the Northwest Business Forum put out a 2 million rand reward. That's about $110,000 for anyone who had information about the assassination. The Business Forum put forward a 2 million rand reward for information. Yes. Did you get any information from that? Information leading to the successful prosecution. Okay. As I speak to you, there's not been successful mm. prosecution. This is Temba Guabini. Whoever has ordered the hit must be arrested, regardless of who he is. We are sitting in a deserted guest house north of Pretoria. When I phoned Temba and asked him for an interview, he said, well, that depends on what you want to say. 
Temba is a member of the Northwest Business Forum, a well-known politician, a former municipality mayor, and an old friend of Botswana's. This forum is really a group of middle-aged men, a collection of people in the Northwest province who try to protect each other's financial interests, but in the form of an official body. And not of the hitman, right? You want prosecution of the person who ordered the hit. Everybody who is involved, regardless of the position that they hold, right. they must be prosecuted. The Northwest Business Forum, what, how would you describe it? Like how many people are involved and what, what is its function? Well, its function was that there must be uh, uh, equity. There must be equity in terms of projects. And those who are in provincial government, they must not uh, double dip. They can be in politics and also business at the same time. Mm. You see? And, and that's how the, the business forum began to mobilize. This is central to the conflict that led to Boswana's death. He was the deputy chairman of the Northwest Business Forum when he died, and he made it his business to oppose politicians who appeared to be using their positions to make money. However, he was also opposing politicians who stood in his way. Boswana was a billionaire at 43, a, a rand billionaire, but still. It's hard to stress how popular, loved, and successful this guy was. His house was featured on lifestyle TV staple, Top Billing. Top Billing. This home prides itself on modern design while respecting its surrounding African landscape. Equally important to architect Werner van der Meulen was optimizing its views and creating a comfortable space for his clients. The client for the house being Boswana. The result is 777 square meters of luxury. And chunks of his funeral were broadcast on the evening news. A life cut short. Many remain shattered by his killing. His family is devastated. Dad, I'll see you when I see you and forever love you. This is his young daughter, Camogello, dressed entirely in black, except for a checkered headband, looking into the SABC cameras at her own father's funeral. I pray that you just give forth you peace. And I just want you to know that it's been a long day without you, my friend. He's survived by his wife and four children. Mulimawao Nemotwa, SABC News, Pretoria. And that power he held is important when you think about how he attacked the provincial government and specifically the premier, Supra Mahumapelo. And there had been a match which he led. I wasn't there. I was in Pretoria at that time. Uh, but there's a match that they led in uh, uh, the shopping complex there of uh, the crossing. You know, not far from the McDonald's, they demonstrated there, and he was very specific. Supra, the premier at the time, owned that McDonald's restaurant, which is why it was a focal point for the marches against the province. He called on Supra to say he must make a choice. He must either be in politics or in business. Supra has four children, and he has been with the ANC, the African National Congress, the ruling party, his whole life. You know, there are those comrades that we used to be with in the trenches who turned against the revolution. Uh, an appropriate name is that if they turn, they become mishwemb, mm. they become sellouts. You see? It's probably about the right time for me to explain Boswana's dealings with the province, and by extension, the Premier Supra. At the time of his death, Boswana was involved in a drawn-out battle with the Northwest government over a 456 million rand, about $26 million hospital contract that was awarded to Tosonga developers, Boswana's company, and its joint venture partner, Lima Projects, in 2008. The province's Department of Public Works, Roads and Transport terminated the contract in 2010 after Lima Projects was liquidated and Tosonga Developers was found to be without the necessary construction industry grading. So 
Tsonga wasn't able to complete the contract, but they agreed to exit the deal in exchange for a settlement of 23 million rand, so just over a million dollars. The settlement amount later ballooned to nearly 30 million rand because of interest. Shortly before he died, Boswana took on the Northwest government in the Constitutional Court. The government was trying to stop Boswana from attaching 44 government owned vehicles and 30 million rand in cash. So when he was assassinated, I really, I really said, look, it's an irony that this fellow would be assassinated immediately after taking on the Northwest Provincial Government. They, they saw this as undermining their authority. Right. And in their myopic thinking, they thought that they are the beginning and end. They were in some republic of Bukonibu Pirimor, the republic of Northwest. Temba here is referencing the old Bantustan that was active during apartheid, and a large section of it was made up of the northwest province of today. So they can trample on everybody. Like seeing themselves as a separate country. Yes, and all these people who are in business, all of them, without exception, these are people who fought for this freedom. Look, Bozwana took the right way, challenged this fellow to the Constitutional Court Mm. to show that he was right. The Constitutional Court uh, uh, ruled in his favor. This is true. After his death, Boswana was awarded by the Constitutional Court to be paid out. Do you think that these guys would even have the ability to say we are apologizing? They won't. That's why that M- Premier did not even finish the term. Super was ousted from office amid violent protests against him in 2018. In the face of corruption and maladministration, this country will go to the docks. This freedom will be meaningless. Everything that people are yearning for uh, will not be realized because uh, when people entrust the ANC, they entrust the ANC with clean governance. But if members of the ANC abuse that trust, surely there has to be consequences, regardless of the position that you hold in government, Mm. regardless of how close you used to be. We used to be very close with Supra. Mm. But if people change and become, become tyrants, they can only become tyrants when those who are close to them, those who know them, keep quiet. Here I should say that Temba believes it was Supra who ordered Boswana's hit. And he has been very public about his beliefs, making accusations on a number of occasions. You've accused him of being involved in the assassination quite publicly. How did he take that? Well, I really didn't care because if uh, the question is one, are you involved or not involved? Mm. We always had our own uh, suspicions which we still hold up to today, mm. until some t- such time that this thing is ventilated in court, then. But for now, we suspect the provincial government of the Northwest. What makes Temba's accusation of Supra ordering the murder more compelling is that it was echoed by a gang member. The gang member turned state witness and filed an affidavit with the Gauteng Police's Provincial Investigations Unit. In the affidavit, he claimed that Supra ordered the hit on Boswana, and Supra is said to have offered 10 million rand to the assassins for Boswana's murder, along with two others. But there is no way that is going to end with uh, those who pulled the trick. Mm -hmm. It can't be. Mm -hmm. It will never be. It can't be, because they were merely doing a job for who? Mm. That's what we must get, because if we don't do that, because um, if we don't do that, it will be um, really uh, would have uh, failed justice. I put all these accusations to super spokespeople over text, and he said he would not speak to us on the matter. It must be said, though, that Super has denied the accusation that he ordered Boswana's hit to other media, 
In September 2019, he said in a statement that all this stuff were fabricated lies and the allegations are part of a plan to destroy me. These quotes appeared on IOL.co.za. And also Guabeni's comments should be taken in the context that the Northwest Business Forum and Supra have been in a bitter feud for years. We have three people in this story. Boswana, the murdered billionaire, Vusi, the assassin, and Supra, the powerful politician who is accused of ordering the hits. Each of them have built successful empires, and all three of them have fallen. Boswana was killed, Vusi is on trial, and Supra was ousted from office. I turned to Mark Shaw, director of the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, to give some perspective on the case. You know, one of the lessons that we're learning globally, and this applies in South Africa, is you get clusters of assassination. For a very good case is local government um, uh, officials or journalists in Mexico. So, you know, you it's not just one case. You get a cluster of many cases as a system is created uh, around the assassination or, or targeting of, of particular people. Mark says that these assassinations are dependent on a number of contextual factors. Now, those contextual factors are usually the development of a criminal or quasi-criminal market and the presence of a number of people freely available for hire. And uh, the South Africa case fits that pattern in quite a particular way, actually. And and the Boswana case fits that pattern um, uh, illustrative of, of the South African case. First, you need people willing to be hired. So violence has to be part of your society. You need people who have access to weapons and who are practiced in killing. And you have a accumulated experience of doing that. Now, my thesis, at least in the South African case, based on our data, is that the taxi industry has spawned this kind of violence. And as the this particular case that you are looking at uh, shows, uh, it shows it in quite a practiced way. So over half of all cases of assassination in South Africa uh, are linked in some way to the taxi industry. And uh, I've made the argument previously that indeed the taxi industry has served as a kind of reservoir for uh, um, for hitmen, and and what 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 essentially develops is is individuals who move through a series of stages uh, practiced in the killing of others. Now, some of them these don't have to be highly militarized or practiced uh, necessarily by by the standards of say special military units. But what it does Im- imply is, is, is people who may have killed several people, uh, maybe in a relatively messy way. But that process of killing over time is integral to the operation of, of that business. It is about eliminating people for, in this case, economic reasons. A, a sort of real commercialization of violence, it becomes cheaper, easier, accepted, to kill somebody who stands in your way for economic reasons, for tenders, for example, in in a, in a fair number of cases, rather than negotiating with them, that suggests important breakdowns in the criminal justice system, a, a kind of acceptance that you can get away with this, a degree of impunity. We are going to be hearing more from Mark as he talks us through the business of assassinations in a later episode. We'll look forward to that. Meanwhile, here is Temba again talking about Supra. Sometimes it's true that uh, power and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And uh, a person just change. And I'm not the only one, I'm sure, who's holding that view. He has changed. I mean, he used to be close to Bozwana. He knows him very well. Bozwana used to be there pledging monies to the ANC. But there he was. He couldn't pay him. He had to fight him up to the Constitutional Court. So allegations have been made. And as enticing as they are, I need more proof. And that's what I'm going to go after in the next episode. More evidence that might show that our man Supra is somehow involved in Boswana's murder. You've been listening to Too Many Enemies. 
This podcast series has been produced by me, Paul McNally, and podcasting company Volume. It's brought to you by the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime in partnership with News24. You can find out more about the Global Initiative by visiting globalinitiative.net. That's globalinitiative.net. The music for this series was composed by Aman Mori. This episode was mixed and mastered by Gwinch Sarame and Richard Rumney. Join me next time for the second episode in this series of Too Many Enemies. Goodbye. Next time on Too Many Enemies. And in this situation, there was government involvement, there was speculation, and that is the case, that there was a high up uh, official from government involved, which gave the command that Boswana Wandile is to be taken out because he is literally a pain in the ass. Volume.